Hey guys, so in a previous video I said that I will be talking about fungi, bacteria and viruses. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms and these organisms are not able to carry out photosynthesis because they don't have chloroplast. And the most important function, the most important character of a fungi is that they are divided into two parts. Simply, there can be unicellular fungi, like the one that I have drawn here. This is an example of an yeast cell. The yeast that you add in the bread, the yeast that comes with the pizza, the yeast that is used in beer production, that is a unicellular fungi. So if you look at the structure, it has a cell wall. It's made out of chitin. This is very important. It's not made out of anything else. It's made out of chitin. They do have mitochondria and they do have a nucleus, they do have a cell membrane. But apart from unicellular fungi, fu fungi can also be multicellular. Apologies for the ugly diagram, but I tried my best, yes. And they have the multicellular fungi, for example, are the mushroom, the toadstools. If you want, you can note down these examples. They have the ability to spread their legs around. So they just go like that. And, you know, in simple structure, they can just overlap and form structures like that. Just drop their heads like that. So these outermost projections, they are called the hyphae. The spores that are present in multicellular fungi can be useful when it comes to reproduction of the fungi. So the spores can just... Uh, expose themselves around. I mean, they just can go along with the wind. Whereas when it comes to the unicellular fungi, yeast cells usually they reproduce by a process known as budding. So how they carry out budding is that one cell gives rise to another and then they break into two different cells. Multicellular fungi, the fungi with the spores, have the ability to send their spores outside and reproduce. So the most important part, I have zoomed in for the hyphae, you can see that it has a lot of nuclei. This has an important part, that is, they get their nutrition from saprotrophic nutrition. This is a process by which the fungi, they release enzymes outside the body, outside the fungal body, and they usually the digestion takes place outside the body. So when the digestive products are outside the body, they later absorb it back into their body. So if this is the body, they later absorbed back into the body. The enzymes which were initially secreted outside the body the enzymes that were initially secreted outside are known as extracellular enzymes. So the process, this entire process of enzymes being secreted outside the body, digestion taking place outside the body, and substances being reabsorbed into the body is known as saprotrophic nutrition. It's actually saprotrophic, saprotrophic nutrition. Then we'll move on to the bacteria, the prokaryote. The microscopic organisms, they do have a cell wall and their cell wall is made out of peptidoglycan. On the other hand, bacteria have some special features such as they have a capsule. I always like to think of this as a blanket that covers the body which helps them survive in extreme environments. They also have a flagella which helps them swim from one place to another. They have the genetic material in an open space. We know that they're called prokaryotes. The reason why they're called prokaryotes is that they have no organized nucleus. Therefore, their genetic material is just going to lie around. In this area, we call it the nucleoid region. So they have plasmids. Another important feature is plasmids. If I zoom into it, plasmids are just going to look like spherical structures like that. So they have, they carry genes that code for 
antibiotic resistance a very important feature in most of the bacteria not very good for humans but good enough for bacteria because they carry genes that for antibiotic resistant eukaryotes and prokaryotes have a feature in common have one more feature in common apart from the cytoplasm and stuff they have ribosomes not very similar to the eukaryotic ribosome but they do carry ribosomes and that is pretty much it about bacteria so if you want to know something more about bacterial diseases that could be uh, tuberculosis or pneumonia tuberculosis is usually caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and then we have the important bacteria such as lactobacillus bulgaricus which is used in yogurt production so uh, you can uh, search up for these things if you are interested and those this means bacteria has good qualities apart from the bad qualities no not the disease causing only then we come to the virus is it living or is it non-living well i'll let you think about it till i explain the structure very simple structure guys it just has an envelope which they steal from the host cell a protein coat and its genetic material could be either DNA or RNA. Viruses only reproduce inside the living cell answering our question. We are not sure if it's still a living pathogen or a non-living. So, so far it is categorized under a non-living organism. It's simply categorized as a particle. The reason is that they reproduce only inside a living cell. So, if you watch my first video, I speak about the seven, eight life processes that should be carried out by living organisms, Mrs. Seagren. In that, I speak about that if you want to be a living organism, you need to follow those eight life processes. Whereas viruses, they reproduce, that's just one feature, but they reproduce only inside a living host. So there raises questions where viruses don't carry any of the other life processes. They have a wide variety of shapes and sizes and examples could be the tobacco mosaic virus that causes the discoloring of leaves in the tobacco plants and the influenza virus, HIV virus that causes AIDS. It's a very deadly pathogen. Last but not the least, I'll just give you a small introduction about protoctis. These are also microscopic single-celled. A uh, special feature, they are single-celled, single-celled and some like amoeba, they live in pond water, they have animal cell-like feature, this is just one cell. So the amoeba gets its food by a process known as phagocytosis. So what it does is, they extend these feet, they just extend their feet like that. And capture a prey in the middle of the mouth that they create by their own body. These feet that they extend outside from their own body, we call them pseudopodia. It's called pseudo, which is false, and podia stands for feet. They're technically known as the false feet. So they absorb their food this way and expel it in the same way. Then we have another protoctis, the chlorella. The chlorella has chloroplast, that means it has properties like a plant. And the plasmodium, you, you must be familiar with him. Plasmodium causes malaria. Yes, it's a malaria parasite. And that wraps up our lesson. It's a very easy lesson. I'll just tilt the screen around so that you guys can see everything that we have learned so far and you can take down notes no harm in that and the next video i'll be talking about enzymes so stay tuned